The first thing I would like to do here is to introduce the, the students and uh, basically and the research group that did this uh, research. So none of the students were able to come here, so that's why I'm giving the talk. I didn't give a talk at a conference for six years, so this is a unique uh, opportunity to me to remember what was it like when I was a student. The, the first student here is Yong Wang. He was a visiting student in my research group and he stayed there for two years. In two years he wrote five papers. And he did a really great work. And I was thinking that if other visiting students were like him in my group, I would be something like Tom Anderson or, or something like someplace there. Uh, Daniel Bergener was an undergraduate student uh, at Northwestern. And he uh, graduated. He is now working for Ford Motor Company in uh, uh, Ann Arbor. Marcel Flores was another undergraduate student working on this project. He finished his uh, Northwestern uh, BS studies, and he came. He, he, he went to University of Utah to do to, to do a PhD in mathematics. But now he's coming back to my group to do PhD in computer science, and this shows that he is a reasonable person after all. <laughs> uh, and finally, Chen Huang is a good friend and our collaborator, and he's here in the audience. So. Let me try uh, first to, to, to say something about the problem. So the problem is f fairly well known. How can you determine a geographic location of an internet host? And then the first question, uh, 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 basically the first issue that might come to mind is like, well, we have GPS today, right? Why would we ever care about a system that would uh, be able to, to, to geolocate an end user? You have a GPS, it works. It, there could be some noise there, but it works fairly, fairly fine, right? Even if you're indoor and GPS doesn't work, you have a many, many systems that actually can give you accurate location. You have people from Google and Skyhook. They are driving their trucks all around the world, and they are sensing these Wi-Fi networks and trying to understand uh, the, the, the exact ge geographic location. So the question is, why do we need uh, IP geolocation services in this day and age? Well, all these systems enable the end user to figure out where he is. It doesn't let the server to know where the user is, right? This is a fundamental difference, right? Because there are many, many scenarios in which the server would like to know where the user is and the user either doesn't care or doesn't want to share this information with the service. Examples are security applications, access restrictions, for example, uh, automatically checking the zip code where the user is coming from. Online service access analytics, if you, if you have a large, big uh, website, you want to understand where these users are coming from, because once you know that, you may figure out what content they might be interested in and so on. And then the final application is location-based online advertising. Here is one example of street-level online advertising. If you're uh, at Manhattan and you are somewhere uh, uh, north uh, in the city, basically this is the, the green triangle, Around you, there could be uh, small businesses that are interested in sending you advertisement in this particular case. And then if you are in Korean town, for example, there you are. Other businesses may be interested in sending you another uh, uh, advertisements, and so on and so forth. So what we are claiming here is that we are the first uh, host independent IP geolocation system that can give you this level of granularity for this type of uh, applications. Uh, so we are not the first to work on this problem. So I will first introduce, uh, I will next go on and introduce some of the previous work in this area, because this will help us understand how we are different and what is that we are doing uh, differently from, from those previous uh, things. So constraint-based uh, constraint geolocation transactions on network in 2006, this is the work by people from the University of Boston. And basically, uh, if you have of a number of uh, vantage points on the internet. You can go on and send packets to that particular target. You can measure the, the, uh, the, the delay that takes that packet to reach the destination. And then you, you simply go on and convert that distance into the geographic distance, right? And then you constrain around all of these vantage points. And eventually, you come up with the region in which this particular IP, uh, this particular IP is, right? Uh, now, the, the bad news is that this doesn't really give you a particularly high accuracy, but it's a very good uh, uh, first step in, in, in trying to resolve this problem. Of course, I'm not talking about many other previous solutions to this approach. I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to give you the, 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 the newest ones. And then the median error distance for this one is uh, 230 kilometers, uh, approximately. 
Uh, next, in IMC 2006, there was a paper by people from University of Washington. And there, the idea was like, oh, you don't have to probe from these endpoints. You have these routers on the way to that target. And if you have, have those routers, that gives you more information, right? So if you go on and, and constrain and use that information, you can do much better. And indeed, they did uh, much better. So you can see that the median air, dis air distance is 67 kilometers in this particular case. So the, uh, the most recent, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, work in this area was by uh, the people from uh, Corn Cornell University. It is the Octan system, NSDA 2007. And then they also used uh, the network topology to figure out where the user is. But in addition to that, they uh, use some external information. right? For example, if you end up geolocating uh, a host in the middle of nowhere in, the, in, in, in a desert, you're going to say, oh, it's not likely that you, this user is actually in, in the middle of desert, right? So by using this information about the population of uh, where people actually live, you can do much, much, much better. And then they achieve the median air distance of, of 35.5 kilometers. Now, we have designed a geolocation system that does 50 times better than Octant that works 100 times better than TBG, and it works 300 times better than constraint-based geolocation. So I'm going to try to explain what is different and how do we achieve this. So if there is a moment in my presentation when you should stop looking at your laptops and look at, 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 uh, at this presentation, now is the moment. Because the next slide shows the two key uh, ideas standing behind, behind this, this particular paper. So the first idea is that websites often provide the actual geographic location on their, on their, uh, of the associated entities, right? I have a website, uh, 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 and that web server is somewhere at Northwestern University, and on my front page there is my address, right? And it really is the geographic location where I come from. Now, this holds for many, many entity, entities, universities, businesses, government offices, and so on and so forth, right? So what we're doing is we develop methods to mine this information from the web and then use this as for geolocation. I'm going to explain a little bit in more detail in the next slide. Now, the second thing that we, uh, that we are doing here is that we are using relative network uh, uh, delays instead of absolute network delays. What does that mean? That means if I measure a distance between myself and another point on the internet, I can get, for example, six milliseconds. Right? Because, for example, the last mile on that particular link is, it, 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 it gives you higher delays. Right? And if I try to convert that into the, the actual distances, I can end up like 700 kilometers away from where the user actually is. Now, we say, forget about that. That's never going to give you accurate results. Right? So what we are saying is that in an environment in which you have high density of these landmarks, just stick to the relative network distances. Right? If I'm closer to you, I'm uh, uh, in the relative network sense, despite the fact that that delay may be inflated, it's likely that I'm going to be closer to you in the geographic sense. And this is, this is the key idea. So let me uh, dive a little bit deeper into this particular scenario. Here is an example of an institutional network. And typically, you have a, an access router. You have the mail server, web server, and the clients down there. So what we are doing is we find this uh, website. We take the, the geographic location from that, and we use this particular web server as a landmark. Now, the fear could be like, oh, but many people are not hosting these websites locally. And that's true. And it's, and it's, it's going to be even more true in the future. So what happens if this guy goes to the cloud? Well, if that guy goes, goes to the cloud, the email exchange server still stays on that particular location with high probability. Right? So we can associate the geographic location taken from the website with that particular email server. Right? And this email server can serve as a highly accurate landmark for geolocation. This is the first part. The second part is the role of network, uh, relative network distances. Uh, I'm not sure if, 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 you, if you have a good uh, view on that. But the idea is that if the target is closer to the landmark A, then the measured delay between that target and, and the closest landmark is going to be uh, smaller than the distance to the other landmark, and so on and so forth. OK. 
So far, so good. So let me, uh, let me walk you through an example of how actually the whole system works and how are we able to actually uh, accurately geolocate IP addresses. Here we have a target IP address. The number is given there. And we know uh, exactly the location of this IP, IP address. I'm going to explain later how do we know the location of this particular IP address. It's in Washington, D.C., right? There it is. Let's see how our system works. So in the, uh, in, uh, we have three tiers, three steps in which we, we figure out the geolocation. In the first tier, uh, we find the cross-grained region where this target is, is geolocated, where this particular IP is. And we, uh, there are many ways to do this. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we just copy-paste the CBG method, right? Just probe this from multiple vantage points, figure, uh, uh, convert uh, uh, measure delays into geographical distances, and come up, uh, create an intersection. So the intersection in this case is that red dot almost uh, in the picture. Now in the second step, what we are trying to do is to use these passive landmarks that we already have to determine the finer grained region where this target is, right? Now, so, th so the first step, we populate this particular region uh, with uh, the, uh, landmarks in this particular area. But the trouble is that now we don't have access to these particular landmarks because these are passive landmarks, right? You can't send a probe from that landmark to the target. So what we are doing is that we are indirectly estimating the distance between this particular target and the landmark by uh, simply sending trace routes from multiple vantage points and then trying to estimate the smallest, pass the smallest distance between a uh, the target and a given landmark. So in this particular case, uh, th 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 there could be basically uh, a multiple, uh, 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 multi uh, multiple options to, to, to estimate the distance between this uh, a landmark and a target. So what we do, we simply pick up the smallest one. This distance is still typically inflated still. Right? Because this is indirectly measured, but it can still give you a, 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 a good information. So with this in mind, what we are doing is uh, we create an even smaller intersection where the given IP is. Right? And it's shown, uh, uh, it's shown with, the, with the red arrow. And now the third final step, now that we have converged to an area where, where uh, the, the IP is, we are totally abandoning now absolute network measurements because they are inaccurate to give you a good location at, a, uh, at, at uh, a fine crane. So the goal is to, uh, to, to, to basically uh, geolocate the target IP using passive landmarks. So what we do is we, it looks very simple. Select the landmark with the minimum delay to the target and associate the target's location with it, right? And if there is the second moment when you should stop looking at your laptops and look at this particular uh, presentation, this is the second moment, right? The wow moment is that by using this approach, you get geolocated across the street, right? Because your neighbor has a website or there is a business there, they host that, and we were able to associate you with that guy across the street, right? Not always is this the case. We've, uh, I'm showing a, a very nice case here because that's what we do in papers. I'm going to show a much more. Uh, 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 I'm, uh, I'm going to show you uh, this for for, for basically uh, other cases as well. But this is this is the key idea. Okay. So to understand how, uh, why this happens, let's have a look at the following picture. The the picture tells uh, shows us. On x-axis, we have geographic distance. These are the landmarks in the vicinity of this particular target, right? And the distances are, uh, it's, it's like 600 meters from the target, right? On the y-axis, you have the measured distance in kilometers. This is if you would just want to uh, 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 convert these distances that you're measuring into the, 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 uh, the geographic distance in this particular case. So you can see that on y-axis, you have this scale goes to up to 1,000 kilometers. It's totally screwed, right? Because you have uh, many reasons why, uh, because basically you have the last mile uh, inflation and, and, and whatnot. On the other side, looked at on the x-axis, 
Why not perfect? You still have that the relative distances are quite nice, quite reasonably preserved, right? Because it goes up more or less, right? It's not always the case. You have scenarios when it drops down. It's not perfect. For, uh, I mean, whoever uh, had a uh, uh, chance to, to work with network measurements knows that things are anything but perfect, right? But this, this is the reason why we are able to do this, this uh, accurate geolocation. OK. So I'm now going to talk about things. I'm just quickly going to jump or uh, uh, tell you about uh, things that you can find in the paper that, that, I, that I'm not going to talk about here. The first is verifying landmarks. Uh, these are the methods that we use to basically check whether a given landmark is at a given uh, geographic location. I'm, I'm, I'm going to step over that. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer later. And then uh, we also had some analysis, theoretical analysis on resili resilience to errors. If you remember, we had a in our team, we had a guy who, a theory guy, so, so he was insisting on pushing this direction. In any case, what we have shown is that even if you have, even if you have errors in the sense that the landmark location is not where we think it is, the, uh, uh, the error that is introduced in geolocation is still limited. Right? It, uh, I'll be happy to, 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 to explain more, uh, but at the end, uh, not now. OK, so evaluation. We had three data sets that we, uh, for which we had ground truth about, about the IP addresses. The first one is Planet Lab. This is what everybody else uh, used, so we use that as well. It's straightforward. We, we know the locations of the universities around the world and other institutions. We, in, in addition to that, we wanted to check how does our system work for residential networks, because this is really very, where it matters, right? So we collected a data set of IPs by simply standing up a website and then asking people who we trust to simply tell us, like, okay, I'm, I'm accessing your website from this place, I'm accessing via this particular provider, and here is my exact geographic location. Now, we were able uh, in this way to collect uh, some number of IPs, but that, again, is not good enough for, for conferences, right? So then, in addition to that, we also had uh, a very unique uh, uh, access to a very unique uh, data set. Basically, what it is is, uh, I can't tell you the, the name of the provider, but by looking at the author list, you might figure out uh, what that may be. So, so, so basically, we had uh, access to, to, to a popular search engine, and then we were looking for driving directions that people are living there, right? So when, uh, uh, basically, when people go from point A to point B, it is likely that one of those locations is associated with their, with their home, right, with a particular IP. And then by uh, applying some heuristics, we were able to mine a large number of IPs and associating them with particular geographic locations. So uh, these are the three data sets. And then I'm going to discuss some of the factors that we have uh, here. Dina, how am I doing with time? I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, thank you. Excellent. Uh, so I'm going to discuss some of the factors that impact the accuracy of our system. OK, data set characteristics. For the data sets that we had access to, we know the ground truth, right? So we looked at like where these IPs are, are uh, in, which, uh, uh, in which areas are they? Because it, it matters whether they are in urban area versus rural areas and so on and so forth. So here on the x-axis, we have the population density. Uh, in people per square mile. So you, you see there is uh, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000, and so on and so forth, right? So you can see that the three data sets cover both ru uh, uh, rural and urban areas, right? So for the, in particular, uh, Planet Lab is the most urban of all the three data sets, then the residential one, and then the one we got from the online maps. Uh, and then the second thing is that we still have uh, some amount of IPs in ru rural areas. For example, as you can see, in particular, the tail of the online maps data set goes uh, more to the left than for the other two data sets. And hence, uh, we are covering some areas where you have maybe 20 people live in that 
on a square mile, so this, th these are very uh, sparsely populated areas. And this uh, plays the role in, in, in basically uh, th the amount of accuracy that we can have for these particular areas. Okay, here, here are the baseline, uh, baseline re uh, results. Uh, for the three data sets, you can see that the, the key thing is that the uh, uh, median error distance for Planet Lab nodes, in our case, is 690 meters. This is relative to 35.2 kilometers, which was the best previous result. So we improved this by 50 times. One important, other important result is that we are able to move the tail for 50 times as well, right? The, the, the tail previously was 276 kilometers. We moved that to 5.25 kilometers. This is the worst result we had in the Planet Lab case. Now, for the other two data sets, for the residential data set and the, for, for the online maps data set, you can see, see that the uh, curves are almost identical and this comes from the fact for two reasons. Uh, one, because the number of landmarks close to these residential areas is smaller than it is in the academic environment. But even more importantly, it is the access networks, DSL and cable networks that affect also this particular uh, accuracy in these areas. I'm gonna explain this in more detail next. So the landmark density, here on x-axis, uh, uh, we have the, the distance uh, uh, around the target from zero to six kilometers. And on, on y-axis, we have the landmark density. How many landmarks are there in this particular area? So you can see that the red curve, which is Planet Lab, has the, large, uh, 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 the largest uh, number of landmarks, which is not a surprise because uh, you can find a large number of such accurate landmarks in an academic uh, uh, scenario. And then we have uh, the second one is the residential and then finally online maps. The next picture I'm showing here is that we, we put all these results together and then we wanted to see how does the geolocation accuracy depends on the population density, right? So here on x-axis we have the, the, the error distance goes from zero to 13 kilometers and on y-axis we have the population density, 10, 20, uh, 10, 100, 1,000 and so on people per square mile. So you can see expectedly that the error distance is smallest in densely populated areas and this is not a surprise, but it's important. I mean, it, it, it's much better than that we have good accuracy in rural areas, right? You don't need it. It's, it's important to have good results in the areas where people actually live. Necessarily, as the population density decreases, so does the error distance. And then one extreme case here that we had, middle of nowhere, that's the point, that's how we call this point. We found uh, uh, one of the users in the, uh, from the online uh, data set, uh, basically lives in a quite deserted area, like th th there are maybe 15 people per square mile living there. Nonetheless, we, uh, uh, there is a web server 13 kilometers away from that particular location, and we were able to accurately associate this particular uh, web server with this particular user who lives in this deserted area. Uh, the role of access networks. So basically, uh, because in, 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 uh, we basically collected all the IPs for which we know the ground truth and for which we know the particular ISP provider, right? And we wanted to see if there are any differences between them. So by looking at the data, we saw that for AT&T and Verizon, we come to approximately 1.5 kilometer from the, uh, uh, this is the, the median error. However, for Comcast, it was a bit longer, right? 2.38 kilometers. So we, we tried to understand what's going on here. And basically, we figured out that AT&T and Verizon are basically DSL uh, providers. Comcast has a little bit of DSL, but it's mainly a cable provider. Now, what happens on cable net, uh, and, and uh, as I'm uh, showing here, uh, there is uh, uh, the error for the for the Comcast is uh, the median error is 700 meters uh, uh, worse, and then the the tail is two kilometers worse. So what is happening on on on, on cable networks? It is well it, it, it is well known that basically the uh, the latency is, is is changing changing a lot over over a short time scale. So there is a, a large variance in latency. Now this affects our system, despite the fact that we are resilient to inflated latency, which happens on DSL networks, this uh, latency variance at short time scale can, can actually uh, uh, reduce the performance. Of course, this can be handled 
uh, effectively by doing uh, multiple measurements, but the speed of measurements is something that we care about as well. So in this particular case, we, uh, uh, we gave uh, presence to speed. To conclude, we have designed a geolocation system able to geolocate IP, IP addresses more than one order of magnitude better than the previous system. This is a host independent system right, that doesn't require any collaboration with the end user. Our methodology consists of two components. First, uh, mining landmarks and then using a web and email servers scattered around the world for uh, accurate geolocation. And the second one is using relative network distances as opposed to absolute network distances to, to reach this result. Uh, that said, I think I finished a bit earlier, but I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, hi, Ashok Narayan and Cisco. So it seems that um, most of the error, the, if I get this right, the use of relative versus absolute has washed out a lot of the error once you get good landmarks. And I was wondering so if, you, like once you get good landmarks, uh -huh. um, then the, the use of relative versus absolute washes out a lot of the errors yes. you know, in, in yes. the distance from the landmark. True. So I'm wondering if you have considered using well-known landmarks like town halls or post offices uh, where you know, you, you know for a fact exactly where they are. We, we are using them. Uh, I'm not sure if it was clear in the presentation, but we are not sticking to, uh, we are basically browsing the web and then getting whatever we can. Okay. Hi, I'm Chen Xiangguo from uh, Microsoft Research Asia. So, uh, actually, I enjoyed the talk very much. So it's, uh, only the people who did this kind of work know that uh, the, the heuristic actually worked quite well. So I have several questions. The first is, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, do you know how to extend the, the work to, to different parts of the world? For example, in uh, people speak different language with this factor or result. The second that is uh, uh, in order to uh, get uh, quite uh, accurate result, perhaps you assume that uh, you can have a very large number of uh, landmarks or the web servers. How large that can be, it can be? So if I understood the question correctly, you're asking uh, what about the international coverage? Like in US, yeah. we were able to do this. So uh, in US, we were able to get so far, when we were writing this paper, we had 70,000 landmarks or so. Now we have close to 200,000 landmarks, right? So. And now, uh, uh, so for Europe, we have no trouble. So, so, so basically, the, uh, I mean, uh, it, it's possible to get these things. Uh, if you mentioned the language problem, I guess uh, you can call things in Chinese, I guess. That works <laughs> as well. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, so actually, it's a, a quite unrelated question is that, uh, from the DNS lane to IP address mapping, so can you tell us the, the ratio? I mean, the, from, from the, you know, so how many DNS lanes are actually generally mapped to the same IP address? So. I have no idea. We have to ask the students. I know, I don't know. Okay, so basically we did something else, so quite strangely, so, you know, for example. So, so if you're asking whether we are checking if, 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 if a given domain name is associated with the same IP, we of mm -hmm. course check that, right? Yeah. So, so, I mean, that's one of the things that we are doing. One, th uh, uh, one final thing to check whether the landmark is good or not is to use the system itself. I mean, so how, how do you feel, feel, feel to the arrows? So basically, it's, uh, uh, we so actually can, you know, for example, can find that uh, uh, hundreds of thousands uh, DNS names actually map to the same IP address. And, uh, but Certainly. that's, f yeah. yeah. So, so if, if, if tens or hundreds of IP, of, of domain names uh, map to a single IP address, we just mm -hmm. kill this IP address, we don't use it. Okay. We, 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 right? It's, it's not good for us. A simpler one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. One, one small question. Is this an open system? So, uh, can I try this myself? 
uh, this is going to be a commercial system. We're going to start in, in July 2011 for US, in September 2011 for Europe, and then 2012 for the rest of the world. So I actually have a, yet another question is that uh, from That's server, you again, okay. okay. We had a lunch yesterday, you could have asked all these questions, but that's okay. <laughs> so from the server's point of view, it's, uh, for example, a search engine you mentioned that, uh, so they may have uh, quite a good view of you know, where the IP address locates. So how, so will this kind of uh, database actually de devaluate your, your work, for example? Also what you are asking is if, uh, if you, if you have a search engine, so, so how does a search engine know where I am? The way we, we did it? Uh, they can construct uh, how? Geo, how? How? Sure, so I mean, you can ask users about anything, right? They're not gonna tell you. The, the bottom line is that this is indeed user-independent system, right? So, and even if you don't have a very large-scale search engine, you can still figure out where users are. So, so that's, that's the bottom line. Okay. So, thank you very much, thank Alex. Thank you. And thank you guys for being here at NSDR.